Dr. Jonathan W. White is with us this evening, a little under the weather, but he is with us because he's dedicated to this, uh, this wonderful talk. He's Associate Professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University and a senior fellow with CNU's Center for American Studies. He is the author of numerous books, including Emancipation, the Union Army, and the uh, Re-election of Abraham Lincoln, and also Midnight in America, Darkness, Sleep, and Dreams During the Civil War. He is co-editor of Our Little Monitor, The Greatest Invention of the Civil War, which he's going to share with us on that wonderful work this evening. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan White. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and I apologize if anyone showed up last Wednesday and was <laughs> looking in the window trying to see if, if this was going on, but I, I appreciate uh, the Virginia Historical Society for inviting me back. I hope you can bear with me. I'm a little under the weather, and you know, I, I just got out of class as I and drove up here in rush hour, and I let the class out a little bit early so that I could make it up here. And as I got out, as I was dismissing them, I said, I'll see you all on Thursday. It gives you a little bit of a sense of how out of it I am. <laughs> but hopefully, I'll, hopefully I'll, I'll stick with it here. And I have to tell you, when we scheduled this talk, the book was scheduled to come out in October, and then it got pushed back to November without explanation. And then it got pushed back to January without explanation. And now if you go to Amazon, it's actually slated to come out on February 15th. I hadn't seen the book until I got here tonight. <laughs> I have to tell you, it is a lovely looking book. <laughs> so fortunately, VHS was able to get a couple copies. And the title actually comes from a phrase that was commonly used during the Civil War to refer to the monitor. It appeared widely in the society. Soldiers would talk about our little monitor or write about our little monitor. This is a patriotic token, basically a penny, that people would use because there was shortage of currency in the North during the Civil War. And you can see the phrase, our little monitor, and it has the monitor in the middle of the token. And I think it gives you a sense of just how much affection people in the North had for this vessel. This vessel was like none other in uh, the Civil War, or I would even suggest in American history. People of that era and since have had a special affection for the Monitor. And maybe I'm a little biased, and you'll have to forgive me. I'm a Yankee. I'm from Philadelphia originally. Um, but what I'll do tonight is start off with sort of a broad overview, the familiar story of the Monitor, things that most of you will probably have heard before or be familiar with. And I want to do that just to make sure that everyone sort of knows the, the story of the monitor itself. And then I'll transition into telling you about some of the things that are not as well known about the monitor and its battle with the CSS Virginia. And I'll just say up front, and I'll explain this in a minute or so, I'll use interchangeably the CSS Virginia or the Virginia and the Merrimack. And I think it's just because living in Newport News, when you talk about the monitor Merrimack Bridge, it just gets ingrained in your, in your mind, even though you know the official name of the Confederate ship was the Virginia. At the beginning of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln instituted a blockade of southern ports. This was a really controversial decision on his part because legally it recognized the Confederacy as a foreign belligerent nation. This is a cartoon that was published in 1861 called Scott's Great Snake, and it refers to Winfield Scott, who was a Virginian who stayed loyal to the Union and was the, the top commander at the beginning of the Civil War for the Union. And it gives you a sense of what the plan was, blockade southern ports and strangle the Confederacy so that they can't get what they need from outside and also can't participate in commerce to get things that they might be producing out to the rest of the world. Now, the Confederates wanted to be able to break the blockade, and they tried to do this on a number of different occasions. One of the most important points to try to do this was in Hampton Roads, Virginia. The Union controlled the Gosport Navy Yard down in Portsmouth, and, uh, but the Virginia militia on April 20th, 1861, was ordered to go in and to seize the Gosport Navy Yard. And so what the Union did on their way out was they lit it on fire because they didn't want the Confederates to be able to get the ships that were held at Gosport Navy Yard. And these are some uh, contemporary images that show what the destruction looked like down there in Portsmouth. 
there is a vessel there known as the Merrimack. And this is what the Merrimack looked like before the fire. <coughs> the vessel burned down to the hull, but then where it was in the water was protected. And so the Confederates had an idea. They would raise this up out of the water, put it into dry dock, and then turn it into an ironclad vessel. And so that's what they did. They hired a salvage company known as the Baker Brothers. And I have no idea how they did it with the technology back then. But they were able to go dive and raise the hull up out of the water. And the plan that the Confederates came up with was to turn this old sailing vessel into an ironclad ship. And so they took the hull that survived, and then they built a casemate over it of iron. And it had 10 guns inside. And this was going to be what they would use to try to break the blockade in Hampton Roads, because they figured the blockade is made up of wooden ships. And wood is not going to fight well against iron. And so the Confederates started on this very early. Now, there were a number of spies down here in Virginia. One was actually a black woman, and uh, her name was Mary, Lis I don't know quite how to say her last name, but it's something like Lestuve or Lestuvre. And she actually made it all the way to Washington, DC, and met with the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, and told him, this is what the Confederates are doing. And what she said aligned with what other informants said. And so the Union realized that they needed to come up with an ironclad of their own. Now, I don't know how they do it today. But back then, they figured the best way to get an ironclad vessel was to advertise in the newspapers. <laughs> <coughs> So this is an advertisement from the New York Times. And you can see the top of it, ironclad steam vessels. And I'll read you a little bit of this advertisement because it's really quite funny in hindsight. The Navy Department will receive offers from parties who are able to execute work of this kind. Now, pause for a minute. Work of this kind, France has one ironclad at this point. England has one ironclad at this point. I don't know who they think is going to be able to say, yeah, I'm doing work of this kind. But that's what they wanted to find. So to execute work of this kind and who have engaged in it, of which they will furnish evidence with their offer for the construction of one or more, and then in all caps, ironclad steam vessels of war. <laughs> And then it goes on, and, and you may be able to make it out. The, the print isn't perfect. But it talks about sails and masts and ropes. And I mean, they're thinking about the age of sail. They haven't quite figured out how ships are going to be changing. And in fact, when the Union government first made contracts for the monitor, they required sails and rigging and those kind of things, even though the monitor didn't have that sort of stuff. Now, there were a couple proposals that got before the Naval Board in Washington, DC. One of them came from a Swedish inventor named John Ericsson. John Ericsson is very famous today for having had a number of inventions, some of which were spectacular failures, although I don't think they were his fault. But he had been toying with the idea of an ironclad vessel. And in 1854, he designed one. And this is the design from 1854. He called it a, an impregnable battery and revolving cupola. And he pitched this to the emperor of France, Napoleon III. And the emperor just was not interested. But when the Union starts looking for an ironclad vessel, he figures, well, I've got something in the works. He modified the design a bit, though. And this is the design that he came up with. And you can see he turned the cupola into a turret. And the turret is that round area in the top one in the middle. And then on the bottom, you see a cross section. And the idea, this was a revolutionary idea for naval warfare at this time. The idea was the turret would rotate. And as, because it would rotate, it would enable the gunners to be able to fire in any direction. Normally, with traditional wooden vessels and also with the, the Merrimack, the Confederates vessel, you've got guns on both sides. And so you want to get into an, a naval engagement, you got to pull up next to the ship you're fighting and give them a broadside. And Ericsson thought, maybe there's a better way to do this. People were really dubious about this idea, though. They didn't think it would float. They didn't think it would work. <coughs> and so they said to Ericsson, OK, we'll give, you an op we'll give you a chance to do this. 
you have 100 days to build this vessel. And by the way, we won't pay you for it until it's proved itself in battle. And so Erickson loved to talk after the war about how the, the Monitor was a private ship. He owned it when it fought against the Virginia. It was not yet a, a ship owned by the Union Navy. This shows you an image of the launching of the Monitor in New York Harbor. When it first launched, it had some problems with the steering, and newspaper reporters who saw it said it just bounced around the water. I guess it was on the East River between Manhattan and Brooklyn, and it just sort of bounced around, and that just made them think, oh, this is never going to work. But Erickson figured out the steering difficulties and got it fixed up and ready to head down to Hampton Roads, Virginia. This is a map that comes from uh, the newspapers. I think this one's from the Philadelphia Inquirer from uh, 1862, showing Hampton Roads. Let me see if, uh, oh, I guess that won't work. The bottom is the Elizabeth River, and that's where the Merrimack was stationed. And the Merrimack came up out of the Elizabeth River on March 8, 1862. This was its first voyage, and it was going to be a doozy of a voyage. It attacked uh, several Union vessels. The first one it went after was the USS Cumberland. And this is a modern painting of what that attack looked like. And the Cumberland was just no match for the Virginia. When the men on the Cumberland fired at the Virginia, the cannonballs just bounced right off. The, the Virginia, its casemate, had a slope to it. And so that made it much harder for the cannonballs to actually do what they're supposed to do. And uh, you, it was a bloodbath on the Cumberland itself. And men were, were killed on the ship and jumped off just trying to desperately swim to shore. Next, it went after the USS Congress, another blockading vessel. And the Congress saw what had happened just a few moments earlier to the Cumberland. And the commanding officer thought, Maybe I don't want that to happen. And so he surrendered. He raised up the white flag. Now, the commander of the Virginia was an officer named Franklin Buchanan. He was from Maryland. He, he went with the Confederacy, though, even though Maryland stayed with the Union. And Buchanan had a brother who was serving on the Congress. And so he was relieved that the Congress surrendered. But Buchanan uh, was angered because there were Union ships on, or, sorry, Union soldiers on the shoreline who started to fire at the white flag of the Congress, or they were firing at the Virginia. And so Buchanan climbed up onto the deck of the, of the Virginia and started shooting a rifle at the Union soldiers on the shoreline. It was more for show than anything else. A Union bullet ended up finding him and wounding him. He was so angered, though, by the Union soldiers shooting on the flag of surrender that he ordered the Congress to be lit on fire. And throughout that day and into the night, the Congress burned in Hampton Roads uh, in, in the middle of the waterway. When the Monitor arrived late at night, they saw this eerie glow of the Congress burning. And around 12 or 1 in the morning, the fire finally reached the powder magazine. And it was just an enormous explosion. People heard it from miles around. They said it was like the most incredible fireworks display they'd ever seen. If you make it down to Newport News, you can actually still see the wreck site of the Cumberland. And this is a Google map, so you can see the Monitor Merrimack Bridge there. The Congress wreck site is to the right of that. There's really nothing to see there because that ship exploded. But the, Cum <coughs> Excuse me. the Cumberland wreck site is still there. And here are some images that show you what it's like. And one of the sad things about the Cumberland wreck site is it's been picked over over the years by um, watermen and other people who've gone in and taken things out of it and then melt. In some cases, they've gotten metal out of the wreck site and melted it down so that they could turn it into collectibles. And for a while, you could get Civil War magazines and buy collectibles from the melted down metal of the Cumberland wreck site. Eventually, the Navy said, wait a second, this is our property. And now I would not recommend going to the wreck site unless you have a police escort uh, who says you're allowed to go there. This is one other image of the wreck site of the Cumberland. <laughs> One of the tragedies of this is that the site is, is disappearing every day, and it's only a matter of time before there won't be anything of it left. Now, the Monitor 
was on its way down during this first day of battle, March 8th, 1862, it really arrived just one day too late. And on the very next day, March 9th, 1862, the Monitor and the Virginia battled for four hours in Hampton Roads. And it was, it was a battle like none other in the history of naval warfare. Never before had two ironclad vessels fought each other. And the sailors didn't quite know what to expect. The sailors who were in the turret of the Monitor described after the battle that when the first shell hit them, there was a really loud noise, as you can imagine. And then they kind of looked around and realized they were safe in there. And so they fought for four hours, these two vessels. Ultimately, it was a draw. Both sides claimed victory at the end of the second day of the battle, but neither ship sunk the other. This is probably the most famous image of the Battle of Hampton Roads, but this is one of my favorites. <coughs> this is a painting at the Union League of Philadelphia. If you ever have a chance to go to Philadelphia, I, I highly recommend going to the Union League. They have unbelievable Civil War collections, most of which, or many of which, are related to the North. Um, but if you walk through the halls, you see just incredible paintings and artifacts like this. Now, people around the world were following this battle. And this is a cartoon, a political cartoon from a French newspaper or magazine that I actually found on eBay about a year ago, and I found it just in time to uh, work it into the book. There's 130 images in here, in case you're interested. And um, it gives you a sense of just what the European powers were thinking. Here you have a figure representing John Bull, representing England, and he's being distracted by a Mexican figure who's probably Maximilian. And he swears, he, I, I won't quote him here, especially because I, I don't know French, but he swears at the guy saying, I gotta pay attention to what's going on in America right now, these, this battle between these two ironclad vessels. And uh, it transformed the navies of the world. No longer would wooden vessels be sufficient for naval warfare. Now, that is all sort of general background and knowledge, uh, things about the Monitor, much of which is probably familiar to many of you. And now I want to tell you about some aspects of the Monitor that are, are less familiar. In the aftermath of the battle, Northerners were terrified. They were worried that the, the Merrimack might steam up the Potomac River and shell Washington, D.C. They were worried that if something happened to the Monitor, the Merrimack would be able to go out and uh, savage Union wooden vessels again. And so they started to write to Abraham Lincoln. They figured, Lincoln is a man of the people. He's in charge of this war effort. I've got a light bulb. I've got a really good idea. If I can only get it before the president, maybe he will make it happen. And many of these came with a hefty price tag. Oftentimes, these guys would say, it'll only cost you $500,000, but it'll be worth it. And so I want to show you some of the inventions that crackpot northerners came up with to try to sink the Merrimack. Some of them were projectiles, new projectiles. This is something that someone came up with of a spiked shell that would be wrapped in lead. And the idea was if you wrap it in lead, you'll be able to fire, fire it out of a cannon, but lead is a very soft metal. That's why casualties were so horrific during the Civil War with lead bullets. And so this guy thought, we're going to make a spiked shell that's wrapped in lead. It'll fire OK out of a cannon, but because the lead is soft, when it hits the Merrimack, the lead will kind of squish out, and then the spikes will go into the Merrimack's armor and crack it. And that's how we're going to sink the Merrimack. Some came up with new projectiles that could be attached to the monitor. So this is one, the guy didn't really have a good explanation of how this would work, but he thought, we're going to put my new cannon on the front of the monitor, and if you just get right next to the Merrimack and shoot down at it, <laughs> you'll be able to sink it. This one almost looks like a child drew it. I had actually toyed with an idea. I have a five-year-old daughter, or almost five, and I had toyed with an idea of having her design something to sink the Merrimack and seeing if you all could figure out which one it was. If I had to guess, I would have thought a five-year-old might have come up with this one, just sort of a rudimentary drawing of a cannon with some sort of explosive shell. <laughs> This next one is really beautiful, I think. It's a shell that could be fired underwater. 
who knows how it's going to work, but the, the inventor, and I use the word inventor loosely, drew the battle, the first day of the Battle of Hampton Roads in, inside of this shell. They came up with some plans for maybe dropping smoke powder pills down the uh, smokestack of the Virginia. And so this was a plan for putting powder pills down the Virginia smokestack. And you wonder what they're thinking, like is the Virginia just gonna stay there while you board them and, and try to put these pills down inside? I, I don't think the Confederates are gonna stand for that. Some came up with grappling hooks. This one, the, the inventor thought, we'll put a grapple on the front of the, mer uh, of the monitor, you get up next to the Virginia, you grapple it from underneath, you hold it really close. I don't know what you do after that. <laughs> Again, they're going to fight back. <laughs> this one sort of looks like the jaws of death. That's what I like to call this one. <laughs> this is some sort of mechanical grapple with these big spikes on it. And you just get up there next to the Virginia and chomp down on it. And the spikes will hopefully poke a hole in the wooden hull. <clears throat> This was a cradling option. There's actually two inventions here. The one is a, a grappling hook that will you lasso over the Virginia, and then you rock it back and forth, and make everyone seasick inside. All right, I made that part up. <laughs> and then you'll notice that the inventor here got rid of the turret and instead put on a, a mortar cannon in the middle of the, the deck of the monitor here. And I don't think he thought about, you know, the men were safe inside of the turret. If they have to climb out here and fire the mortar, they're going to be exposed. So this guy has two inventions. I don't think either of them is very feasible. So maybe you just lasso a bomb. <laughs> yeah, again, the, the, the Merrimack is just going to sit there and take it. This next one's one of my favorites. This is a two-part. So, here, you've got the monitor, and you can see it has a torpedo in the 19th century sense of the term uh, hooked up to a line. And what the monitor is going to do in this guy's mind is go past the Virginia here, and so that the line is underneath the Virginia, and then tug it, and then it'll explode when it gets to the Virginia. I would think that the pilot of the Virginia would be aware of what the Union was doing. And you know, it makes me a little bit embarrassed to be a northerner showing you all of these things. <laughs> Some had ideas for rams or spikes. During the Battle of Hampton Roads, the, on the first day of the battle, the, the Virginia had used a ram to good effect against the Cumberland. And so they, northerners thought, maybe we can come up with a new kind of ram. This guy had two different options. One is a spike that you just put on there and you hope you can poke a hole in there. The other is a hydraulic ram that you can see pictured on the bottom, hooked up to some sort of steam power that if you can just get up next to it, you can punch a hole into the hull. This is another sort of ram that has a little explosive on the end. Here's another hydraulic ram. This guy was from Maine, and he designed this long shaft inside of the monitor, and it'll have a ram that's hooked up to hydraulics and poke a hole. Again, some of these look like they could have been drawn by children, and this would be one of them. This inventor, it just looks like he ran out of space on his paper. <laughs> he, he drew the monitor with his idea for this sort of big ram coming out of the front of the monitor, and then he thought, well, I got to fit the Merrimack in here somewhere, so the Merrimack's already going down. This just shows you how successful his ram was. And some people had the idea of why, not, instead of just a normal ram, why don't we put a saw on the front of the monitor? <laughs> <clears throat> now, I don't know how many of you go out in the water, but it's not easy to, to have your boat go forward and backward, forward and backward, to <laughs> saw a hole into something. So I don't think this guy had thought his thought fully through this. A couple of the inventions that didn't have pictures to go, and all these pictures are in the book, by the way. A couple of the inventors who didn't have pictures had some other ideas. Like some thought, why don't we have like a little cavity at the end of the ram that will squirt um, fluid into the Virginia that's flammable. So we'll poke a hole in it, we'll squirt this fluid in, light it on fire, and then we'll get out of there. They had all sorts of crazy ideas. This one I call the dump and sink. You get another vessel, you fill it up with all sorts of heavy metal, you come up next to the Virginia while it's sitting there pass passively, and you dump all this metal onto it, and it'll just be more than the Virginia can bear. <laughs> 
and some came up with new, completely new boat ideas. This one, I don't know what it's supposed to do, other than it has a new pilot house. You can see the pilot in the back, and he's just holding onto a steering wheel. This is one of my favorites. This one, the guy sort of took the best of the Virginia and the best of the monitor. So you can see he has a casemate in the middle of this ship with cannons on the sides and on the, the front and the back. And then he has a little turret on the front and a little turret on the back. And I don't think he thought about that the bow and the stern gun are going to be facing the turrets. And so if you fire those, you're going to be taking out your own weapons. This was an inventor from New York City. He had seen a ship that, he had seen vessels that had taken out piers in New York City, and he thought, maybe we can just do that with the Merrimack. So he invented a sleek vessel that was sort of a metal canoe, and his idea was, we're just going to, it doesn't need any weaponry, we'll just ram up into the Merrimack. This one, I actually just discovered this one last night. This one, I, I, I can never give up on research. Even the book is out, but because I didn't have a copy in my hands yet, I thought maybe I can find more stuff. And this is one called The Tormentor. And the inventor of this guaranteed that he could sink any Confederate ship in 15 minutes. Looking at it, I, I don't see it. Maybe some of you can tell me after what you see here. Here's another ship. This one was called the Annihilator. I've stared at this thing. I have no idea how it was supposed to work, so I won't put you through that. This one is another ship. It's just like a big vessel with some arms, and I think they thought, maybe we can just swat at the Virginia. <laughs> this was a submarine with an explosive device at the end. If you know anything about the Hunley, I don't think that the uh, inventor of this had thought through what's going to happen when the explosive gets into the Virginia. But the idea of explosives was popular. Some thought, why don't we put spar torpedoes on the monitor? Long poles that have an explosive on the end. We just need to get it up to the Virginia, to the wooden hull, where we can blow it up. Maybe we could just hook them up to a tugboat. Here's a, an explosive device on a tugboat. And then underwater cannons were all the rage. Now, on the one hand, when you see some of these pictures, it's just going to make you wonder what these people were thinking. But at the same time, it is interesting that they were having a vision for what we would now know as torpedoes. Even though their ideas never would have worked, they were a couple decades ahead of their time. This guy, this is a beautiful drawing. It's huge at the National Archives. And when I unfolded it to take this picture, I just thought, wow, this is really a beautiful depiction of something that will never work. <laughs> Here's another underwater cannon that just kind of protrudes out of the hull of the ship. Here's one that someone thought, why don't we just hook it up to a chain, and we can lower it down, and we'll have some sort of electronic device to, light up, to ignite and shoot a hole into the hull. This one has some cannons coming off the end underwater there where it's marked A. And then this is my favorite, or one of my favorites of the underwater cannons, an underwater platform that you hook up to the monitor so that the Virginia doesn't see it. And again, though, you have to get up next to the Virginia so that you can get the platform under the Virginia and then just shoot straight up into it. Now, I think I've tortured you with enough of these um, horrible inventions from innovative Yankees. But it gives you a sense of the fear that Northerners had about the Monitor, or about the Merrimack, and the, the, the ideas that they were trying to have percolate to deal with that threat. <coughs> In July of 1862, um, a photographer made it out to the Monitor while it was on the James River. And there's a series of photographs that survive. And you can see in the turret the, the dents of the cannonballs from the Virginia. And the officers stood out on deck for photos, and the men stood out on deck for photos. And I want to say something about the experience of these men. Again, they didn't know what to expect. People were, re were referring to the Monitor as an iron coffin. They didn't know if they would survive the battle. But once that first shell hit and they realized they were safe inside of this enormous turret, they knew that they would be OK. But that changed the way that people thought about naval warfare. And I want to read you a couple quotes um, from the book to give you a sense of 
of how they began to grapple with this change. Shortly after the battle on March 9th, 1862, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy went down and met with the boys of the Monitor, and they were eating a lunch or dinner, and they were just sitting in there, and he went up to them, and he said, well, gentlemen, you don't look as though you were just through one of the greatest naval conflicts on record. And one of the men replied, no, sir, we haven't done much fighting, merely drilling the men at the guns a little. For them, that, there was no danger in fighting against the Virginia once they realized that the Monitor would be able to protect them. The paymaster of the Monitor, a man named William Keeler, wrote a letter to his wife, and he left an incredibly rich collection of letters. And he, he wrote to his wife, and he assured her, he said, that your better half would be in no more danger from rebel compliments than if he was seated at home with you. And he continued on to say, there isn't even danger enough to give us any glory. The thick, heavy plates and iron and bars of iron on all sides, above and below, with two of the largest size Columbiads in the tower. When we think about combat of the Civil War era, we often think about the glory of the battlefield, the charge, Pickett's charge, these men marching, following Robert E. Lee's orders to their doom. We think about the honor that soldiers experienced or gained during the Civil War. But for these men on the monitor, there was no glory to be had. They were protected. Other people began to notice this as well. Nathaniel Hawthorne, the very famous northern writer, went to visit the rat trap, as he called it. And he said this. He said, all the pomp and splendor of naval warfare are gone by. He said, she signaled a sea change that would, quote, breed a race of engine men and smoke blackened cannoneers who will hammer away at their enemies under the direction of a single pair of eyes. Saddest of all, he said, heroism will become a quality of very minor importance. You can't be a hero if you're protected in, as you are in the monitor. There was a woman in, in Washington, D.C. who wrote about this. Her husband was in the Navy. And she wrote in her diary, she said this, I am disgusted that the officers and crew of the Monitor should be so noticed when those of the Cumberland are unmentioned. These were more exposed to danger, did their part nobly, and would have done it successfully had the government done their part at all. In other words, these guys from the Monitor are claiming celebrity. How can they claim that when there was no danger in their fighting? And there's a wonderful poem by Herman Melville. Melville published a, a book, a, a collection of poetry after the Civil War called Battle Pieces and Aspects of the War. <coughs> and he said that he wrote a poem called A Utilitarian View of the Monitor's Fight. And here's just a little bit of it. And it gives you a sense of the changing nature of naval warfare. Yet this was battle and intense beyond the strife of fleets heroic. Deadlier, closer, calm mid storm. No passion, all went on by crank, pivot and screw, and calculations caloric. These guys aren't fighting with honor and glory. They're, they've become men who are like factory workers. And he concludes the poem by saying that war shall be, but warriors are now operatives. And it, it gives you a portent of, of how war is going to be changing. And the Monitor was at the center of that transformation. The Monitor spent the summer of 1862 on the James River. It was swelteringly hot inside. It got up to something like 165 degrees inside of the vessel. But the men couldn't come up onto the deck because there were Confederate sharpshooters on the sides of the James River at various forts. And if they came up out of the heat, they would get picked off. And being on the monitor during that summer was a really tedious time. In the fall of 1862, it went up to Washington, DC for repairs. And then she was sent back down to Hampton Roads and then down towards North Carolina. And on New Year's Eve, 1862, the monitor sunk off Cape Hatteras where it rested underwater until 1973 when it was discovered. The last thing that the, the sailor, uh, most of the sailors of the Monitor were able to escape. 16 men drowned on the Monitor that night. And the last thing that those who escaped saw was the red signal lantern 
And if you ever make it down to the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, you can see this, this is a picture I took of it. You can see the red signal lantern. It was December 31st, but because the Gulf, and this lantern was hot, but because of the Gulf Stream, the water was quite warm. It was probably about 70 degrees. And so even though you had hot glass going into the Atlantic Ocean, this didn't shatter. And it was one of the first things that they discovered when they found the monitor in 1973. This is also at the Mariner's Museum. This is believed to be the steering wheel of the CSS Virginia. And if you go over to the Mariner's Museum, the shipyard has built this life-size replica that you can go walk out onto and see what the monitor would have looked like at the time. They have a lot of artifacts from the monitor. This is one of the Dahlgren guns. These guns were 13 feet long. They weighed nine tons. There were two of them inside of the monitor. And the, the shots that they fired weighed 165 pounds each. And you can see the turret of the monitor being, um, being uh, conserved. And this is a picture. It's not a very good picture, but you can just barely make out the turret uh, in a huge tank where they're pulling off all the, the rust and the uh, life from the sea. Now, when the monitor went down in December of 1862, it didn't end her legacy. And what's really remarkable, and we have a whole chapter on this in the book, is how the monitor came to be used for other purposes. Within a week of the monitor sinking, this advertisement appeared in a Connecticut newspaper. <coughs> the monitor sunk, but the ship of state still floats down the river of time. And Ford and Bartlett in a small boat are coming too, with a few th thousand dozen hoop skirts attached. <laughs> Specimens to be seen at Weatherby and Company. Sample dozens sent at the lowest cash wholesale prices and all orders promptly filled by Ford and Bartlett. I mean, this is a week after the monitor sinks and advertisers are beginning to think about how can I make a buck off of the legacy of this ship? <laughs> The ship became a morality tale. This is a children's magazine that I, I purchased on eBay a number of years ago. And it, it compares the monitor and the fight with the Virginia to David and Goliath. And it uses it to try to teach children Christian values and bravery. The monitor was uh, in songs and poems. They were, most of them are, are not very good, but you can still find them all over the place. And these are three song sheets. You have Give Us a Navy of Iron on the top left. If you want to dance, you can do the Grand March, which is down at the bottom. Or the top right, if you like to polka, you can do the monitor polka. There's all sorts of different options for you. <laughs> In Pittsburgh, during the Civil War, there were things called sanitary fairs. And these were largely run by women in the North who wanted to try to raise money for the soldiers. And in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1864, they had a very large sanitary fair. And they got a model of the monitor. And this is a carte de visite of it. And they had it out there. And you could pay, I think, a quarter a, per a person to go watch it. And it would steam around and fire smoke and things. And uh, it raised, don't quote me on this, it's in the book, I forget the number, but I think it raised about $75,000. I mean, people just wanted to see what the monitor had been like. In the post-war years, the monitor would be used in parades. This is a, a Civil War veteran who's sitting in a little turret of a monitor being pulled by horses. Here's a parade from 1892 in Brooklyn, near where uh, much of the monitor was constructed. You could find it in ashtrays. This is a, a, a monitor lodge of the uh, Odd Fellows, and you can see the turret and the monitor in the middle. And they've named their lodge after the monitor. It was, in doing the research, it was really incredible to find how many things were named after the monitor and the Merrimack after the Civil War. I found mines, mines in Arizona that were named the Monitor and Merrimack Mine because they, they just wanted to connect what their business enterprise was to this very famous battle of the Civil War. If you're going to use an ironclad vessel in advertising, what better to sell than pots? <laughs> <coughs> this company made a whole series of these ads. This is just one of them. And we, I think we have a different one in the book. The, it has the cannons pointing out of either side, which is not how it was originally. And it's just shooting out these, this ironware. <laughs> 
Here, this is uh, a McCormick Reaper ad, and you can see the Reaper on the bottom left. The McCormick Reaper is, is a piece of, of technological innovation that would transform farming. And how are they gonna market that to farmers in the 1880s and 90s? They're gonna connect it to technological transformation during the Civil War. Incidentally, the Monitor had 37 patentable inventions on it, including the world's first underwater flushing toilet. <laughs> you could sell sewing machines to women. This is the little Monitor sewing machine. You wouldn't naturally make that connection. <laughs> A sewing machine and the Battle of Hampton Roads, but there you have it. You could get Monitor flour. If you like to smoke, you can get a tobacco card with Will cigarettes featuring the battle. If you like different th substances like coffee, you can get McLaughlin's coffee. You could get a trade card featuring the battle. If coffee is not strong enough for you, maybe you prefer Monitor Blend Whiskey. Uh, this is from the 1890s, this image here, but the Monitor has continued to inspire alcoholic beverages, and it's a fitting thing when you think about sailors. In the 1930s, you could get Seagram's Gin, and I actually, I have a copy of this hanging in my office at, at CNU, and I contacted their legal department at Seagram's about two summers ago, and I said, I'm writing this book. Would I, could I get permission to uh, use this in, in the book, and they gave us permission to use it, which I was thrilled by. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful ad. It's an American original. Just like Seagram's is an American original, so is the Monitor. Have any of you been to Oozle Finch down at Fort Monroe? It's a new microbrewery. It opened about a year and a half, two years ago. And I know the owner, and he contacted me shortly before they opened, and he said, we want, Oozle Finch was the old officer's mess. And so they wanted to really connect the brewery that they were opening to the history of Fort Monroe. And so he asked me for advice on names of, of beers or stories related to Fort Monroe. And I said, well, I got a great one in the book about a guy named Lawrence Murray. And Lawrence Murray was a steward on the monitor. He was very hot headed. He would get into fights with people. And one day he got drunk and he got in trouble, so they chained him onto the side of the monitor while, he was, while it was parked outside of Fort Monroe. And we don't know if it was suicide or an accident, but he was chained and fell overboard and drowned. And uh, that was inspiration for Short Fuse. <laughs> it's my favorite beer. <coughs> They said they're going to have us down for a book signing, and I'm hoping if people drink enough short fuse, they'll buy a lot of books. <laughs> the ironclads have appeared in movies. In 1912, and this just popped up on YouTube a couple months ago, there was a, a, a silent film called The Confederate Ironclad. It doesn't feature the monitor, so the Merrimack made it into the movies first. But there are several movies featuring the monitor. One is from 1936 called Hearts in Bondage. It's, it's not what it sounds, and, but it is a love story. And then the other is called Ironclads. And both of these, I think, are available on YouTube. They're not bad films. I, I made my wife watch Iron, or Hearts in Bondage a couple of weeks ago. I don't think she hated it, so I, I don't know. But she might have been being just nice. This gives you a sense of how the monitor has been a part of American culture. I remember watching, I used to love Gilligan's Island, and I remember watching an episode from the 60s, I'm not that old, but from the 60s, and a, a little World War II ship comes up to the island and Gilligan turns to the skipper and says, which one is it, the Monitor or the Merrimack? <laughs> In the 1960s, I think most Americans would have known that illusion. I'm not sure most Americans today would know that illusion. Now, I've showed you how the monitor has been connected to all sorts of vices. Coffee, if that's a vice, smoking, lots of different types of liquor and alcohol. But if you find yourself in trouble, you know, from overuse of these things, the monitor can also offer you a solution. And I'll close with just a little reading from the book. If one indulged too much in these monitor brews, or suffered from other ailments, Dr. Ray Vaughn Pierce's pleasant pellets were sure to be as effective as the monitor in curing a whole host of ailments. 
in an advertisement that circulated in the 1890s and featured the monitor and the tagline, small but effective. <laughs> Dr. Pierce promised that his pills were, quote, effective in conquering the enemy, disease. Whether a person was grumpy, thick-headed, and take a gloomy view of life, or suffered from sick headache, bilious headache, constipation, indigestion, bilious attacks, and all derangements of the liver, stomach, and bowels, Dr. Pierce's pellets would, quote, clear up your system and start your liver into healthful uh, action. Effective, just like that little monitor that met the Merrimack in Hampton Roads. Thank you. <laughs> um, I had told them that I was, I, I've, I've not been feeling well today, and hopefully I've been tolerable to listen to. So I, I had told them I wasn't going to do questions here and would do them at the signing table, but I suppose I'm feeling better than I was expecting. Um, <laughs> but they might not have a mic here. Haley, is Haley? Oh, I lost her. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to be at the signing table, and I would be thrilled to talk to anyone who has questions about any of this. But thank you so much for having me.